There we go. Thanks very much, Anne. Welcome all. I'm Angela Yu, the CCCBA Real Estate Section Secretary Treasurer. A quick reminder to section members and to our Alameda County Bar Association counterparts, the section puts on MCLE programming like this one on the third Friday of almost every month of the year, and we invite you to continue to join us throughout the year. Today, I have the honor of introducing not one, but three distinguished speakers, Marie Kwashnik, Mike Buslink, and David Austin. Marie is a seasoned attorney whose practice spans both the litigation and transactional realms. She has not only represented clients in a broad array of civil litigation, but also advised clients on a wide range of real estate transactions, including leasing, sales and acquisitions, and financing transactions. Marie is also a director at large and the elections chair of the CCCBA real estate section. Mike also has extensive experience serving as an advisor and advocate to clients in both real estate litigation and transactional matters. On the transactional front, he has represented clients in both broker assisted and private real estate sales transactions, as well as lending transactions among many others. On the litigation front, Mike's expertise includes resolution of landlord tenant disputes and of course, partition actions. David is a skilled civil litigator and trial attorney who has tackled complex business construction and real estate litigation, including litigation involving contract disputes, construction and construction defect claims, and homeowners association disputes. David also serves, as Anne mentioned, on the executive committee of the Alameda County Bar Association's real estate section. If you have questions during today's presentation, please ask them using Zoom's chat feature and we'll get to as many as possible at the end of the program. With that, I'll hand the mic to our stars, David, Marie, and Mike. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we've structured this in a three-part uh, presentation and I will be going first with, Mike, you wanna flip the slide, the second slide? There we go. Uh, we're gonna we're going to do this uh, like I said in three parts. I'm gonna start with this historical uh, background. Marie is going to discuss the uh, Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act that was actually enacted in California, and uh, Michael is going to take the probate and the state's considerations. Uh, and then I think we're all going to join back on when it's time to uh, reach the section of the issues to address and obviously to participate in the Q&A to the extent uh, we are asked. I see we have a lot of chats. Feel free to put your uh, questions down and we'll take them at the end of the uh, presentation. All right, let's get started. Um, so you, when I first heard about this act, I asked myself the question and rarely is asked, why? Why are we doing this? Uh, what was wrong, perceived to be wrong or actually wrong with the existing partition uh, statutes that we have and use every day as litigators. I, I know I myself have uh, litigated several uh, uh, partition cases, even through trial in some cases. Marie has extensive experience as did Michael. So I wanted to understand why it was that we were doing this. So what was wrong? Um, so I think almost everybody knows, uh, is familiar with a, uh, what a tenancy in common is. And that's where um, individual tenants in common do not own a particular part of a parcel of a tenancy in common property, but and so instead own a fractional interest in the undivided whole, much like you know, a shareholder in a corporation. Um, and if you're not aware, in most states, uh, if you inherit property through intestacy, meaning you're, uh, somebody died and you inherited the property, without a will or a trust or any other sort of uh, estate plan, you will inherit the property as a tenant in common with whoever else inherits the property. Uh, uh, historically, and we're going back to England and these, when I say historically, once you inherited a, a tenancy in common or became involved in a tenancy in common, they were uh, permanent. You, there was no way to extricate yourself from that relationship short of, I guess, death. But uh, in the mid 1500s, uh, the English created a statutory right to partition in kind only. And as 
review, partition in kind means you physically divide the property. So one large piece of property subdivided into two parcels or certain parts of the property are split between two people with a separate uh, and complete ownership of their parts. Of course, these days that's relatively impractical given that the large majority of the property cannot be subdivided, but that's, uh, we will get to that a little bit later. Um, so when the colonists came here, of course, we brought the English law with us. And so we had the same basic structure. Uh, tenants in common owned their properties commonly and could get out of their, um, their tenancies only by partition in kind. Uh, around the time of the Civil War, however, several states began permitting partition by sale, which is uh, when, of course, the property is sold and the uh, proceeds are split amongst the tenants in common according to their fractional interest in the property. Um, but the courts consider this new authority to partition by sale an extraordinary and dangerous power, and that's a quote, that they only should exercise in very limited circumstances in which uh, necessity, which such a sale was clear. Um, just double check something here. Can you advance the next uh, slide, please, Michael? Um, okay. All right. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, and so they would only exercise that power uh, in very limited circumstances when the necessity for a sale was clear. Over time, states be began to develop a preference for partition by sale over partition in kind, applying an, quote, economics only, close quote, test, which is, was the fair market value of the pro whole property higher than the fair market value of the aggregate value of the parcels resulting from an in-kind partition? And one of the perceived problems with this test is that it does not account for any claim that the property may have special uh, significance to a particular tenant, say with mom and dad's or the family property for decades or even generations. Uh, and if the land has a broader historical or cultural significance, and if the land uh, is needed to provide shelter for family members who are poor or infirm in some way. So why did it become such a prominent problem? Well, nearly half of Americans don't make wills. So a substantial amount of real property passes to heirs as tenants in common. Within poor and disadvantaged communities, uh, the tenancies in common became known as heirs property, which is where we get the name for this particular act. Uh, because most real property passing between generations, especially in uh, poor and disadvantaged communities, will pass through intestacy due to the lower rate of making wills in these communities. So over generations, uh, each generation takes a smaller and smaller and smaller share in the property uh, as time passes. And you can end up with you know, 20 to 30 owners of the same piece of property. If mom and dad or grandma and grandpa bought it you know, 50 or 70 years ago. Uh, so the, one of the problems that, that academia and uh, those who look at these sorts of things, I suppose, identified was these fractional share interests that have a very small interest are vulnerable to real estate speculators, is the belief. Meaning that a, uh, someone who is in state of need, they need cash or whatever, or can sell out their interest to a speculator who can then turn around and force a sale through partition against the will of the majority. Uh, the AP, for example, has revealed that developers and speculators have partitioned laws to acquire desirable properties in states throughout the South owned by black families for generations. So the, the speculation works as such. You buy the fractional share, often from the vulnerable family members. You file an action for partition by sale. Uh, partition by sale often is often ordered and sales almost always yielded prices well below the market value. And you would ask yourself, why is that? Well, here in California, if you're familiar with partition at all, typically uh, if it's a residential property or a um, condo or something like that, uh, 
we would just uh, have the court or the referee in a partition action uh, identify a real estate broker and list the property on the open market. However, in many states, uh, a partition by sale is treated as a, like an execution or for non-judicial foreclosure sale. So in other words, um, the property is put up at public auction, but there's a little bit, there's some uh, problems with obtaining fair market value when this process uh, is uh, enacted. Uh, the potential buyers may not even know the sale is occurring. Uh, they have little time or opportunity to visit and inspect properties. And it's difficult to ascertain from the minimal descriptions required by notice uh, requirements whether the potential buyer would even be interested. And I think, Michael, do we have the slide of the, uh, um, the one with the picture from the, uh, yeah. So this I pulled out of the Contra Costa County Times last week, and this is your typical notice of sale. This is one that's for a uh, foreclosure sale, but you can see how dense it is, and you don't even learn where the property is until the red area down here when it's circled. So what this ha what this results in is a forced sale uh, when you sell it in this manner at auction on the county courthouse steps. I mean, there are people who follow these types of things regularly and make businesses out of them. Uh, but it's a very specialized industry. And most significantly, when you bid on a piece of property at auction sale like this, you have to usually pay in all cash. So you better have the ability to deliver a certified check at the time of the auction if you're the winning bidder. Uh, and I think another problem that wasn't raised in the materials I reviewed, but I have personal experience with is uh, these types of auctions can be rigged in terms of the few people who actually do this on a regular basis, colluding with one another to artificially uh, suppress the uh, price. They, they agree ahead of time, uh, who's gonna buy the, that property that day at what price? And they, help, they hold a auction and then they take the title and then they auction it amongst themselves. So uh, in fact, the case I was involved in resulted in a federal criminal conviction and first time and hopefully last time this ever happens, I was sitting in a deposition with this, this person was present and he got the call saying report for jail. So uh, these are very real things that can happen to really, uh, uh, to can happen at these forced sales. All right, so as I said, these problems aren't that common in California in terms of not getting fair market value for the property. Uh, the, the problems you do encounter is, are mainly those um, by people who are, uh, let's say they live there, one of them lives there uh, and the other co-tenants do not. And a, a non-resident co-tenant wants to force a sale, uh, which they have the right to do, but then typically the proceeds don't uh, provide enough money for the person who was living there to obtain a replacement property. And it also has, can have detrimental impacts on people who are, as I said earlier, infirm or uh, have no other place to live. And so those problems can be dealt with, but not by this statute. Um, so, so how did the uh, Heirs Property Act attempt to reform these problems? I think we're ready for the next slide, Michael. We have got it up already. Okay, so they, They provide for an opportunity for the uh, other co-tenants to buy out the uh, one co-tenant who wants to sell at fair market value. So basically, Marie will give us the uh, details about how it works in California, but basically they have a chance to have the property appraised and then the other co-tenants can decide to purchase. Uh, it also bolsters a, a preference for partition in kind. It rejects the economics only test and allows a court to consider the special characteristics of a property in the course of the uh, partition by sale process under this particular statute. Uh, and there's also revamped uh, sales procedures designed to yield higher prices. Um, and as I said earlier, this is a nationwide uh, proposal and uh, I don't know how much I know it'll change some of the sales here in California, but um, I don't know whether it was really a 
that's a necessity. However, it's a law now. And so we as real property litigators need to understand it. Um, and Marie will tell us how well these goals have been uh, obtained in California's version of this act. Um, so how far is this spread? How many jurisdictions have, uh, have uh, accepted it? Well, there's, as you can see from the map here, it's been adopted or substantially adopted in 21 states and it's being introduced in eight additional states, which if adopted, we'd have you know, a majority of the states following this rule. And so at this point, I, I would expect, I would not expect there to be a deceleration in the rate of acceptance, only an acceleration, especially with large states like Florida, New York and California and Texas uh, having adopted the act. And with that, I will hand it off to Marie and thank you for your attention today. Thank you, David. Okay. So um, as David explained, um, the new California Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act basically grants a person who gains an interest in real property from a relative the ability to buy out that interest uh, from any co-owner who files an action for partition of that real property. Um, and it sets the procedure for determining the buyout price. The act went into effect on January 1st, 2022. So it doesn't apply to any partition actions um, prior, you know, that were in that that were filed prior to, to that date. Um, and as we discussed earlier, or as David discussed earlier, the general rule in California is that a co-owner has an absolute right to force the sale of a jointly owned property. Um, and um, that action generally results in a market sale of the property unless the co-owners agree to a buyout of the partitioning property's in, uh, party's interest. Um, but without an agreement, the court will generally order the property to be sold, the proceeds to be divided, um, unless the court were to determine that there was some in-kind division possible or requested. Um, typically, this happens by way of what we refer to as an interlocutory judgment, where the court appoints and supervises a partition referee who handles the sale um, and who files one or more reports with the court and distributes the proceeds to all the owners. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I'm just going to talk real quick about the threshold requirements. Um, as I just mentioned, the act changes the general rule of, of uh, absolute right to partition by adding these new sections um, that creates this buyout procedure. The threshold requirements are number one, the partition action must have been filed after January 1st of 2022. The property must qualify as heirs property and there must be no agreement between the co-tenants regarding partition. So once again, does not apply to any cases uh, retroactively or filed prior to January 1st of 2022. Next slide, please. Um, what is heirs property? Um, contrary to what you might think and what David was talking about earlier, in California, the, the definition of heirs property is not limited to property that, that is inherited after someone dies. Um, heirs property actually includes property where one or more of the co-tenants acquired title from a relative and um, either through an inheritance or an inter vivos gift um, and any one of the following apply. So either 20% or more of the interests are held by co-tenants who are relatives or at least one individual who acquired their interest from a relative holds a 20% or larger interest or 20% or more of the co-tenants are relatives. So in other words, use of the word heirs is kind of misleading because the act applies to any property that's acquired from a relative. The only exception would be those who uh, uh, meet this qualification, uh, but uh, hold less than 20% of the ownership. Um, so next slide, please. Um, what is a relative? Um, well, the act defines relatives fairly straightforward. Um, basically parents, grandparents, children, and grandchildren, and then this sort of big category of collateral relations, which includes spouses, domestic partners, uncles, aunts, nieces, nephews, in-laws, adopted uh, children, stepchildren, foster children, and so on. Uh, so it's kind of a big sort of catch-all category. Um, so you can imagine when you're 
uh, doing a client intake, um, you're going to have to ask a whole bunch of questions now because, um, you know, how people acquired their interest in the property is going to become very, very relevant. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the first step with a partition action under this Heirs Property Act um, is this initial determination. Um, and so upon filing of that action, the court has to determine, first of all, if it's an heir's property. Um, I've already filed a couple of these and I generally actually put it in my complaint or allege it if I believe it's an heir's property. I just kind of do that. I, I think the court still needs to make that determination, but I include it. Um, if it qualifies as an heir's property, then the court must determine the fair market value of that property. And so the court will do this by appointing a disinterested real estate appraiser to determine the fair market value. Um, and if the appraisal is ordered, the appraiser must file a sworn or verified appraisal with the court. Um, the appraiser must appraise 100% of the property assuming a sole ownership in fee simple. However, if all the parties have agreed to value the property uh, differently or use some other method of valuation, then the court is required to adopt that valuation method um, or value. Um, the court can also decline to order an appraisal if the evidentiary value of the appraisal is outweighed by the costs. So a situation like this might include, uh, might come into play um, if the parties are very close in their determination of value and the property is difficult or the property is difficult to appraise. So for example, if it's a very unique property with no comps. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so after that appraisal takes place, there's an initial hearing regarding the fair market value. So basically not later than 10 days after the appraisal is filed by the appraiser, um, the court sends out a notice to each party um, and stating what the appraised fair market value is and informing the parties that a copy of the appraisal is available from the court clerk's office. Um, and then any party may file an objection to that appraisal within 30 days after the notice is sent. And then following that 30 day period where you could object, um, then the court sets a fair market value hearing um, and, and it considers all objections to the appraisal if any were filed and any other evidence of value offered by that party at the hearing. Um, after the court holds the hearing on the appraisal, the court then sends out a second notice to the parties with the final fair market value. Next slide, please. Um, so now this gets interesting. So once that gets sent out, it's really important to understand that only a co-owner who hasn't requested partition by sale may exercise a right to buy out the um, other co-owner's interests. So this means that if you've elected or you filed an action for partition by sale or elected partition by sale earlier in the process, then you're prohibited from buying the property at the appraised price, even if the appraisal comes back at a lower than expected price. So for example, if it's a great deal, um, you're sort of stuck with your initial decision to uh, do partition by sale. Um, so then the court then basically notifies all the parties who have not requested partition by sale of their right to buy out all the interests of the partitioning parties, the ones who want to sell. And, and tells these parties that basically they have 45 days to exercise their option. Um, the purchase price of each partitioning, partitioning co-tenant is the tenant's fractional interest multiplied by the fair market value. Um, so, and if only one party elects to purchase, then that party has the right to purchase the interests of all the other partitioning parties. If uh, more than one party provides um, or elects to purchase, then the court will allocate the right to purchase among those who have decided to, to purchase. Um, if there's no non-partitioning co-tenant that, that, that desires to uh, exercise their option to purchase, then the court will proceed to a partition by sale or in kind if, if applicable. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so then there's a procedure where um, 
funds are deposited into the court. And so the court will set a date no sooner than 60 days for a non-partitioning party to deposit their money in court. If all the funds are deposited in a timely fashion, then the court will issue an order reallocating all the interests among the co-tenants and dispersing the money to the tenants that are selling. Um, notably absent from the act is any procedure for requesting more than a fractional interest uh, due to partition offsets. So for example, attorney's fees, costs, other offsets, reimbursements, credits in an accounting. Uh, there, is, there does not appear to be any procedure um, for the court to, um, or, or for a party to request more than their fractional interest from the court. So this is, uh, this is an oversight, I think, that will need to be addressed um, either through precedent or some sort of legislative uh, change. Um, so if none of the non-partitioning co-tenants co deposits their money in court, then the court will once again proceed with a partition by sale. Um, if any of the electing co-tenants fails to pay their apportioned price that they were supposed to pay, then any co-tenant that did pay has the option to elect to purchase all of the remaining interest by paying the entire price into the court for that person who decided not to pay. And they've got 20 days to get that done. Um, if more than one co-tenant jumps in and tries to purchase that, that um, remaining interest, then the court will reapportion the interest among them, disperse the amounts, uh, held by the court to the parties that are entitled to them and then promptly refund any excess payment by the, by the court. Um, if any of the electing co-tenants fails to pay the entire price for the remaining property, for the remaining interest, then the court will proceed with the partition by sale. Um, so we have to move on to slide nine, uh, sorry, the next slide, please. Um, and, um, so if the court orders a partition of an heir's property by sale, so now we've moved on to a sale, um, uh, section 874.320 limits the court's ability to apportion the costs of partition. So the, the general rule in partition actions is actually found in section 874.040, um, and it requires the court to, port, to apportion costs uh, the, uh, specific costs of, of partition. And it states specifically, the court shall apportion the cost of partition among all the parties in proportion to their interests or make such other apportionment as may be equitable. Um, uh, section 874.010 defines cost of partition to include reasonable attorney's fees uh, incurred or paid for the common benefit of the co-tenants. Uh, fees and expenses of the referee, compensation uh, provided by contract for services of a surveyor, um, reasonable cost of a title report, other disbursements or expenses determined by the court to have been incurred or paid for the common benefit. Now, unfortunately, it looks like uh, with heirs property, uh, this new section 874.321.5 um, actually says, uh, says the opposite. It basically states that in an action for partition of heirs property, the, the court may apportion costs of partition, including an appraisal fee um, pursuant to section 874.040, except that the court shall not apportion the cost of partition to any party that opposes the partition unless doing so is equitable and consistent with the purposes of this chapter. Um, so this seems to be contradicting uh, section 874.040 or it creates some sort of inconsistency. And um, I, I, as of yet, there are no reported decisions on this new section, but I think there's gonna be some interesting litigation. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to um, Mike. Thank you, Marie. Um now that everybody has an overview of uh, the new act and the new process, I'm going to talk mostly about how the act may impact trust and estate administration and also estate planning. And uh, then at the end, we'll have a discussion about uh, different issues we've identified with the act, uh, if you haven't heard some already, uh, and then we'll move on to Q&A. 
Well, first, I want to say that generally uh, for partition cases, there's no such thing as winning. Uh, the goal as a practitioner is to lose just a little bit uh, to protect your client. Um, so if you have the option to completely avoid a partition action, whether or not the act's procedures applies, uh, that's usually the best option for the client. Fortunately, for probate and trust administration attorneys, um, they may be able to bypass the act's process entirely. Uh, remember that the act is designed to apply to inherited property after the heirs become owners of undivided interest in the property. So let's talk generally about partitions and probate and trust administration, and then we can address how the act may inform the decisions and strategies you may want to think about. Probate Code Section 11950A permits a personal representative of an estate or any of the beneficiaries or heirs to petition the court for partition of property, both real property and personal property, to avoid the distribution of undivided interests. However, there's a limitation. Section 11950B states that only property interests subject to administration can be partitioned in probate proceedings unless the owners of the other interests consent to be bound by the partition. Section 11953A further states that, quote, the court may direct the personal representative to sell property where sale would be more equitable than division and where the property cannot be conveniently allotted to any one party. This and it also says, the sale shall be conducted in the same manner as other sales made during administration of an estate. So in other words, the probate code can require the personal representative to sell the property under the probate code procedures without any recognition of the new act's procedures. Sections 11950 and 953 have not been amended to be consistent with the new act. The act's new appraisal and buyout procedures only apply to partition actions filed under the Code of Civil Procedure. A person objecting to a sale in a probate court might argue say that the act's appraisal and buyout rights should apply to make the process more equitable, but the probate code does not provide for a buyout process. A literal reading of the statutes is that the personal representative must follow the usual probate administration and sale process. What about trusts? Likewise, the probate code has not been amended to require any partitions of trustee held property to be in conducted in accordance with the act. No buyout procedures are required. Section 16226 provides that the trustee has powers to sell or divide property. Sections 16227 and 16230 also provide that a trustee with, has the power to divide, partition, and subdivide trust property. A trustee can adjust boundaries and adjust differences in valuation by giving or receiving consideration. In sum, a trustee has the power to conduct a partition of trust assets without court involvement unless a beneficiary objects and say claims that the trustee's actions are improper. Uh, they breach some kind of fiduciary duty or, or requirement under the trust. But if a trust terminates or the trustee distributes the property to the beneficiaries, the beneficiaries become owners of undivided interests and they vest in their right to file their own partition action in the civil department and subject to the new procedures in the act. So I thought it would be helpful to present a quick hypothetical to wrap everybody's minds around the big takeaways for probate administration. Let's say you have a very common scenario. Um, there's an estate where the only significant asset is the family home. There are two heirs and just one of them wants to keep the home while the other wants to sell. So for a personal representative of an estate, uh, Generally, there are two ways of avoiding partition of property. And I'm telling you here and now that those two options are exactly the same as before the new act came into effect. The first option is very simple. It's for the personal representative to sell the property and distribute the proceeds. As I said before, the probate code provides the option of partition by sale as opposed to distributing undivided interests. The upside of this option is you can probably secure the cash to hopefully pay for all claims and administration fees, and there's no need for a partition action. The downside is one of the heirs won't necessarily be able to own the property as they desire, 
and you may have to resolve an objection by that error. The second, op second option is to distribute the property and let the heirs resolve the issue outright uh, among the, amongst themselves. Uh, the upside is that the heir who wanted to keep the property now gets to exercise the right to have an appraisal and the buyout procedures under the new act. Uh, the personal representative doesn't have to expend any time or resources resolving a dispute about price or valuation. But the downside is that distributing the heirs when you know that they will have a dispute later, it's not generally a recommended option. You're just kicking the can down the road. Uh, it may just end up costing everyone much more later. There also might not be any money to pay for administration fees and, and pay claims. So you would have to be creative about securing payment of fees in the future. But remember, under the probate code, the heir who wants money instead of the property can just object to the distribution of an undivided interest. So then you're stuck with a regular probate code sale process. Ultimately, you might have no choice and the property is going to be sold anyway. So the takeaway is that when you're in a probate administration process, either the personal representative or the heirs can just request that the property be sold and, and that will be the outcome. It might be worthwhile to propose other creative options for re resolution. Here's just a few ideas. Uh, you could propose an agreement for a buyout uh, if the purchasing heir has income, uh, the selling heir could give a loan with a deed of trust uh, recorded against title. Um, uh, outcomes of that can be varied, uh, but uh, if a purchaser defaults on a loan repayment, uh, the selling heir could foreclose and take the property. Uh, that could be a big win for them. Uh, they could also evict any occupants and sell the property uh, or continue to lease it out. So that's one option. Another option uh, is, is if, well, if there's an agreement about a buyout, but a dispute about the price, you could also propose an agreement for obtaining an appraisal and valuation of the property. Uh, but it could become costly if you have to obtain multiple appraisals to satiate everyone's uh, desires or, or resolve that dispute. But it's still probably less expensive than uh, beneficiaries pursuing litigation. Now, if this was a trust matter, uh, probate code section 16228 gives a trustee the power to encumber mortgage trust property even beyond the term of the trust. Uh, if the trust allows, uh, the trustee could borrow money and make an in-kind distribution to one beneficiary in cash and distribute the real property to the other beneficiary, uh, subject to the loan, of course, which would have to be paid off in some way by the beneficiary receiving the property. Uh, but finally, there could be an agreement to distribute the property and uh, the heirs or beneficiaries could enter into an agreement with a waiver of partition, right of first refusal, appraisal and buyout provisions. Uh, you could record a memorandum of the agreement to prevent uh, even third party successors and in interest from filing for partition. And of course, if we're talking about an income property, you could also propose uh, formation of a legal entity like a LLC or partnership. Uh, with an operating agreement or partnership agreement on how to handle management and buy out of the uh, other owner's interests. Uh, are there options in the state planning uh, to discourage partition disputes among heirs? Uh, of course, uh, one obvious solution uh, is just to have a trust or will uh, designating only one beneficiary to receive the property uh, after death. Um, this is always an important topic for discussion with clients. You always have to ask the question, what do you expect to happen with a family home uh, or any other property you have after you're gone? Uh, if they desire the property to remain uh, owned by the family indefinitely, uh, it's probably advisable to explain that uh, one heir or beneficiary could demand that the entire property uh, can be sold. Maybe they don't understand that. You could also designate that uh, say one beneficiary heir receives a life estate uh, or a term of years before the property vests to the other heirs. Uh, let's say there was one child uh, living in the property and the parent wants to provide for that one child. Uh, that could potentially also defer a partition dispute uh, or avoid it. If the property is already uh, held in an LLC partnership or subject to, to a tenancy and common agreement, great. Um, but you could also propose to condition the receipt of uh, a distribution of property upon uh, beneficiaries signing a tenants in common agreement. Uh, trust could provide that the trustee 
uh, could provide an agreement with customary and reasonable terms to restrict partition and provide for buyout or right of first refusal process. It could even mimic uh, the procedures of the new act uh, as a template. Um, now that I've discussed how you can completely bypass the new act uh, as a uh, probate and trust administration attorney, uh, I wanted to turn to a discussion about some issues we've observed about the act. Um, perhaps some of the apparent shortcomings can be addressed by the legislature or local rules um, but this is what we have to work with right now. Uh, so I'm going to welcome Marie and David to chime in with any additional thoughts as I, I kind of go through these slides. Um, for, first issue I wanted to point out is that, um, as explained in prior slides, probate code does not require probate or trust administration to utilize the new procedures under the Act. Uh, legislature might be able to make the procedures more consistent, maybe if just a simple buyout process was incorporated in the into the probate code. Um, second, second thing I saw was that um, the act doesn't really prevent the creation of heirs' property. It just attempts to deal with it on the back end. And so, as we discuss, um, uh, the probate code does a pretty good job of of allowing heirs to object to receiving undivided interests. Um, but there are often situations where as David was talking about, you know, there's successive generations that will receive the property by intestacy and, uh, you know, maybe even their joint tenancy or transfer on death deeds uh, used as estate planning devices. And uh, there's nothing in the act that's going to help those heirs avoid the fees and costs of partition uh, if they inherit a property by deed. Um, it also doesn't prevent the, uh, the speculators buying interest in heirs' property. Uh, or forcing a sale that way, there's still going to be situations where uh, family members have uh, small interests and, and speculators can target those those situations. But, uh, you know, I, I welcome uh, Marie and David's thoughts on this next issue, fees and costs. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that, that disputes are going away anytime soon. I don't think... Uh, uh, attorneys aren't going to be involved in these. I mean, there's no, um, there's no judicial yeah. counsel forms. It's mm -hmm. it's it's a new process. Uh, uh, it, it there might be maybe fee shifting provisions that could be uh, talked about, like Marie was talking about. Um, but but cost of appraisal, timing, uh, notices, delays. Um, yeah, and and I would agree. Actually, Mike, I think something we had talked about. Um, uh, uh, when we were preparing for this presentation, you're absolutely right. The, this is a brand new procedure and it, it, it um, relies very heavily on the court, on the court sort of babysitting this process. And there's these extended time periods, uh, you know, several steps that the court has to go through with all these notices that have to go out that take a long time. And the real estate market is you know very fluid and can you know go up and down and turn on a dime and all sorts of things and the last thing you you want is delay when it comes to selling property you want to try to take advantage you know especially if you have a good market or some good interest rates or whatever you know you don't want to have to be concerned with these with these delays and the other the other concern that i have that i can see coming with this procedure is that you can have certain heirs that want to do a buyout, but um, realistically, they don't have the wherewithal or the ability or the financial ability to do it. And they're just refusing to accept that. And they can drag out the process for a very long time. And potentially, usually they're, they're living in the property and they can drag that out for everybody. And in the meantime, all of the co-tenants have to continue to pay their share of the property costs. I was also going to mention that that you know even ideally under the the procedures of the the new act, I mean you're really talking about at least a four to six month process for a buyout. And um, I mean more realistically, you're probably looking at nine months to a year. I would say know. more like nine months to a year. Yeah, I, I mean that's that's more realistic, but. Um, you know, the, the next part of my slide, you know, the next one, um, 
you know, there's still going to be disputes about, you know, quiet title and ownership and sh sh who should own the property, who has a vested interest, uh, accounting for the proceeds. I mean, that that is not going away. Th th those those will extend the time period to resolve these cases and and even you know quiet title you know or or some kind of constructive trust claim you know you're not even going to get to an appraisal and buyout process until you can have a determination about who really owns this property and so that can just stretch the process out you know quite a bit but you know it also begs the question you know i i think we talked about this during our preparation is you know what is the point of having an appraisal and, and forcing everybody to go through that process if the buyer doesn't have the funds? You know, you don't, you know, they don't have income. There's no proof of funds. There's no loan, loan pre-approval, and and they can still initiate this process without any intention of actually buying the property. And and then there's no there's no fee shifting to kind of deter that that bad faith delay process, if you will, so. Well, I would just add that uh, one thing that seems to be an oversight is uh, what is the role of a referee in this process? As you know, generally the court will appoint a referee and the reason for that is generally the courts are uh, reluctant to have much hand, hand on, hands-on day-to-day management of the process of getting the property ready and selling it. They just want, you know, periodic updates about what's going on. And so this particular procedure uh, contemplates the courts being very hands-on, you know, identifying the appraiser, noticing the uh, when it, his report comes in, holding the hearings and dealing with the money. Uh, typically the courts don't have to deal with any of the money except for approving the final accounting and, and payouts. So I think that's an oversight. The other issue I know, and I've, I've actually tried a case on this, is what if one of the co-tenants says, well, you think the property's worth this amount, but it's, it's not, it should be worth more because the person in possession caused waste to the property. They damaged it in some way. And there's a dispute over that. You're going to have to have a trial uh, over you know, who did what at to what extent. And I don't really see an opening for that particular type of findings of fact or evidentiary hearings in the statute isn't currently drafted so <clears throat> i wanted to uh, i'll go to the next slide but you know to keep the discussion going i, I wanted to uh, uh say that you know I, I thought it was interesting in doing research about the enactment of the act in other states um uh new york actually uh made uh it part of the statute so they adopted the uniform act but then they also added to it uh, requiring that there be a, a mandatory settlement conference within 60 days of filing the partition complaint uh, for heirs property. And um, uh, there are notices that have to be sent out by the court for the MSC. And the statute also uh, uh, has a list of uh, items that have to be discussed by the parties at the MSC. Um, it imposes consequences if, if parties don't participate in good faith um, and, and what's also interesting, I thought, was that uh, the MSC can necessarily happen uh, even before defendants even file an answer. Uh, so basically there, they're trying to get the cases resolved before anybody really has to expend any fees, you know, to move forward, even with the appraisal process, or even necessarily hire an attorney to answer uh, the complaint. So uh, it, it would be interesting to hear whether they achieve success there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I wanted to make a quick note. I mean, it's kind of like a pro tip, you know, in, in uh, uh, you know, litigating under the statute. But, you know, as Marie indicated, uh, you can you can allege in the complaint as a plaintiff uh, seeking partition that it is heirs property. And you can actually go try to get a determination from the court uh, that's heirs property and get the appraisal process going more quickly, even before the complaint is served. And so, um, you know, trying to get that timeline compressed, you know, mm -hmm. if you're seeking to have it, have it sold, the, the act does provide for that, so. And, and I can state from personal experience, I, I filed a couple now uh, under the Heirs Act and I um, had a hearing in front of a judge um, 
on, it was our first CMC. And um, I can tell you that the judge was extremely relieved to hear we had settled the case. I mean, the look on his face was just, you know, <laughs> thank goodness. So I, I think judges are, are you know, if, if they have to start doing this process, I, you know, I, I think it's just more burden on the courts. We're already overburdened as it is. And um, I think, um, you know, David's right that, um, that there's a huge uh, gap in, in the act, I feel, and I agree that there should be a way to have a referee or have the option of appointing a referee to take over some of these duties, um, because I feel it actually, in some cases, can save money. It's going to actually, I feel, cost more for the parties to have their attorneys go to all these hearings and file all these objections and whatever and receive and respond to all these notices. Uh, I feel like that's going to add more of an expense for the parties. Well, yeah, and, and, and the act doesn't really provide the broker with much authority beyond, you know, getting hired and selling the property. I mean, they, they can't yeah. deal with, you know, occupants, tenants. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, the other question, you know, how they're dealing with escrow settlement statements and signature of documents and, uh, you know, as a title company, you going to go along with that. And so, you know, it, it, there's all kinds of questions about what kind of authority the, the broker can have and, and whether or not there are brokers out there that are prepared to take on that. I was role. about to say, I don't I mean, think a lot of brokers will want to take that yeah. Do they get a standard listing agreement or is it a court order? I mean, they, they want the protections, you know, that are standard in their industry and, and, and that kind of compensation for their work. And, and, and they may necessarily need to have an attorney help them report to the court. And, and the, the act makes no mention of, of being able to pay the, the broker or, or reimburse the broker for those costs or who's paying for that. Uh, it, it just says they're entitled to a reasonable commission. So mm -hmm. can they hire an attorney? Can they, can, can they get the court to pay for the attorney? Where's the money coming from? It's just, um, uh, there's a question there. So um, let me see. There were a couple of other hit list items. Let's see. Yeah, uh, uh, David kind of talked about this. You know, the buyouts are still, you know, um, not necessarily accessible for people. You know, people don't have, you know, many options for loans for for buyouts if if they don't qualify. Um, it's it's kind of different in you know it, it, for agricultural land. There, I know there are federal loan programs specifically that have been created uh, based on this uh, Uniform Heirs Partition of uh, Uniform <laughs> Partition of Heirs Property Act. Um, so you so you can get loans for farmland and agricultural land, but but not necessarily, you know, the parent's house. Um, well, if this becomes more popular, I, I wouldn't be surprised to have a, you know, private market solution arise in this context. I mean, you have all sorts of uh, lending products out there, such as, you know, reverse mortgages and things like that, where this may be a, a niche opportunity in the private sector to, to solve this type of problem in terms of, you know, having the money to come up and buy out the, uh, the air. And if, if you uh, were to uh, take out the loan amongst individually or with joint co-tenants, you could probably get e more easily approved and you have the property to secure the, uh, the debt. But it's probably so new, especially in California, that it's not gonna be an immediate availability, but I, can, I wouldn't be surprised if it is within a few years that this becomes more and more uh, prevalent. Well, and, and that's a good point because you, you need the property to secure the loan. And so if there are other co-tenants that uh, are also potentially wanting to buy, but they don't want to encumber the property, um, then where does that leave the co-tenant that needs, that needs that loan? Yeah, uh, the lender wants to encumber the entire property. Right. Not a partial interest, right. So um, just a uh, bullet point, um, you know, the act, you know, also specifies that controls over you know, other existing partition statutes. I mean, you know, it's kind of unknown right now if there are inconsistencies that we haven't identified yet. So <laughs> stay, stay tuned, you know. Yeah, I, I'm sure I'm sure there are probably more. I've tried to identify a few with what I was able to see, but 
it's you, it's like peeling an uh, onion, basically. <laughs> you know, you just don't know what you're going to find as you keep going. Yeah, I, I tend to think that um, it, that is a useful provision. I think it's mainly saying, look, you the courts here can look at what courts in other states have done with this law to figure out how to apply it. And that's always a good thing to have more case law available to help you figure out, especially in a brand new statute, uh, how it should be treated. Uh, I would think over time, as, as our own California case law has developed, there'll be less and less reliance on that. And the concern about uh, keeping it uh, uniform in application, uh, that's going to be almost impossible. Now that you've got you know, right. almost 29 states who are going to um, have this, I mean, that's a nightmare. <laughs> Try to keep 29 bodies of law uh, uniform. So, yeah. And to keep track of it. I mean, as, oh, yeah. as practitioners figuring out, you know, how the act has been construed and applied. I, you know, there's one referee that I was speaking to that uh, seems to be very concerned that, that, you know, this, this can be used to bypass even the subdivision map act. I don't know, <laughs> you know, I don't know if that's the case, um, but there are concerns about, you know, how it would be construed and applied in other states and how that would affect you know, the consistency of the law here in California. Um, uh, RJ, you just reminded me, Michael, look at the comments down here. <laughs> no problem. Uh, that just remind, reminded me, uh, earlier in the discussion we were discussing, uh, I was mentioning partition in kind. And uh, I noticed in the real estate review that I got from the state bar section, uh, one of the new laws that was passed was allowing easier subdivision of residential parcels like you know, single family home parcels. And so um, I'm wondering whether or not that'll um, in increase the chances of in-kind um, uh, partitions. Uh, one other thing is I, we should mention that uh, there's also a partition by appraisal as an option uh, mm -hmm. if you don't do it in-kind or by sale, which is similar to what the act does, but instead it, it they get an appraisal and one party can buy out the whole property from the other parties as opposed to this piecemeal fractional interest purchase. And, and then and all also, parties have to agree. Yeah, all yeah, parties have to yeah. agree to that. Right, but it's also available to a party that maybe initially started out wanting partition by sale. But if the appraisal turns out to be good, then that party's not bound by their prior decision. Yeah. The, the last point I wanted to point out, I, I don't think it's on my slides, but um, you know, what, what's interesting about even this new act is that that generally, you know, there's there's a there's a lack of public understanding about heirs property and partitions generally. And so, you know, what, what's so fascinating about this is that, you know, litigants or well, defendants really, you know, owners in possession uh, might not believe that a court has a power to sell or, or take away their property that they're living in. And so there's still going to be people that that don't have the money to hire counsel or uh, understand have file pleadings to respond, you know, in pro per. So so if the goal of the act is to preserve, you know, ownership, you know, families, um, uh, you know, I think there needs to be more public understanding of of the act and, and its effects and, and make sure people show up in court, you know, engage in the process. Because, I mean, I don't know about you, but there, I, I've experienced plenty of times where, where a, a defendant doesn't respond and, and you get a default. And maybe, you know, at this point, they, they'd be waiving their rights to stay in the property and have a buyout. And they just don't understand that, so. Mm -hmm. um, so do we want to switch to the Q&A now? Yeah. Maybe, yeah, before uh, we do Andrew, that. Oh, yeah. I just want to mention, at, it, are the uh, attendees going to get copies of our of the slides? Oh yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're sending so those I, to Anne, so Anne will have let those. Let me just right. check here which number it is. I think it's probably the last slide, right? Oh yes, yes. The, there there's a slide at the very end that has. Uh, um, yeah, second to the last, and I just you, wanted. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, we'll put that one up. Yeah, this so is there's where some I got the, it's where I got the map, the handy dandy map image, and. Um, it discusses the you know the rate of adoption and then this American Bar Association uh, article is where I drew a lot of the historical background from so anyone who's in, more interested in the background uh, 
it cites a several different law review articles, which are also cited in the uh, slides uh, that documented the problems with uh, partition by sale in some states, particularly the South of the United States. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't know if Angela is coming back. Is in. Angela going to join oh, us? Here, here she is. Here she's coming. I've um, I've at least unmuted myself, but I'm going to keep the spotlight on you three. Um, I think you guys did an, an excellent job at anticipating some of these questions. Um, so you've touched on some of these matters, but there are a couple um, that I think are primarily directed at Mike here. The first is what is a recorded memorandum of waiver of partition? Oh yeah. So uh, what you typically do is first you have an agreement. You know, first first step, first document is to have an agreement uh, for co-tenancy, like a tense and common agreement. And uh, you, you can you know, discuss the rights and responsibilities of the parties. Um, and then uh, within there, you can have you know, appraisal, buyout procedures, um, you know, rights of first refusal and waivers of, of the right to partition. Uh, uh, there are some consequences for you know, all those decisions, but uh, you know, a recorder will not necessarily uh, agree to record the entire agreement, and maybe people don't want that entire no. agreement recorded. Uh, you, you, so you can have it amended in the future and, and just keep that private. But uh, you do want to create a recordable memorandum of agreement, uh, you know, with with uh, uh, an mm -hmm. area for for the recorder to to put their stamp. And it it generally you can look this up in Miller Star or whatnot. Um, uh, it will basically say, you know, here are the owners. They have an agreement between them. There is, uh, you know, either a waiver of partition or their rights are affected, you know, to partition, you know, under this agreement that's not recorded. And mm -hmm. so it informs the world, and, and you know, any successors would have constructive notice of this uh, agreement and that they're going to be bound by this agreement so that they can't come in and say, well, I had no idea about this agreement. I'm not bound by any agreement. I should be able to go partition. So um, that that's what a memorandum is. It's just kind of a, a short one or two page document that that identifies the fact that there's a uh, an agreement uh, that runs with the property. Mike, a, another substantive question that I think is primarily for you. Can a trust beneficiary force the sale of property using a probate code petition over the objections of the trustee and other beneficiaries and prevent in-kind distribution? So I, that's a good question. I, I did not see a probate code statute relating to trust administration that, that require, can require a sale and forcing them not to take an undivided interest in the property. I, it, it, if I went back and looked and found it great, if I didn't, you know, I would, I mean, conceivably have an argument that uh, by distributing an undivided interest to me, uh, you are acting against, you know, a fiduciary duty, a fiduciary, uh, because, you know, you are offloading some kind of dispute onto me and it's costing it's costing me it's to my detriment so as as the the trustee you know you should use your authority under the probate code to sell this property and you know maybe the other owner that doesn't want to sell uh you know they they might have the same arguments but um i i think i think you would have the ability to file a petition uh uh with the court, you know, to to have the property sold rather than to uh, take an undivided interest. Uh, good question. I I think I'd have to look back at uh, uh, seventeen two hundred uh, section on that. Um, this one might. Uh, this one's a little bit of a doozy. This one might be for Marie. But uh, are there appellate decisions in other states that have adopted the uniform statute that might provide insights on its application? There are, I think, and this is what David was talking about, um, and 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 the reason why the act says what it says. Um, it, it it basically says we that you can look to the the you know decisions um, in from from other states um, that have adopted this uniform act 
um, as you know, uh, a, a way to sort of guide the courts here. Um, so that's where we're going to have to. I mean, I I haven't started researching it yet. Uh, there's probably a lot of cases out there. I I would guess. David, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, not directly, but if you go to the website that's linked in here and mm -hmm. you look at the where it's been adopted, it gives you the date of adoption. So I would assume, and the first states to adopt were like early 2010s. So you probably want, if you were looking for case law, I would start there because they probably have the most well-developed case law on these issues. And court accounting for differences between what's the law in California and there, obviously, but that's where I'd start. Yeah. I'm gonna be a little bit selfish here and ask one of my own questions. How does the Uniform Act's provisions on notice interact with the existing partition statutes that allow for the naming of unknown defendants? Oh, I don't think that it changes that and um, or affects it. And I would definitely recommend if you're filing a partition action under the um, Heirs Property Partition Act, I would encourage you to make sure to name unknown because you don't know if somebody who inherited it or whatever or got it from mom and dad, you know, uh, gave somebody else a deed that hasn't been recorded or whatever. Uh, you, you definitely want to make sure that you include all persons known and unknown that are claiming an interest. And I would add that uh, keep in mind that this appraisal by sale in the uniform heirs property is just one aspect of a litigation. So even after you buy out this one person, you still got to partition the rest of the property. And if you don't have the all known and unknown, your judgment won't be very good because someone could come up after the judgment saying, I had no idea what was going on. I didn't get notice and contest your partition action. So I agree with Marie, I always do it. But at the same time, keep in mind that what we're discussing today is just one small aspect of a overall uh, partition case. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, this kind of goes back to the, the you know, the old, old uh, uh, partition statutes. I mean, typically you want to get a, um, a title report or title guarantee, you know, mm -hmm. the property. So, so you're actually identifying all the vested owners, you know, on record regardless. And so, you know, hopefully you'll be able yeah. to identify all the people who have to be named in, in the suit as, as defendants. So in theory, there shouldn't be any no defendants unless for some reason, you know. Somebody has, yeah, yeah, somebody has like a pocket deed or something. Right, yeah. some unrecorded interest, some kind of beneficial interest in the property. And if they step forward to, you know, claim an interest, I mean, uh, they can do that. But uh, I mean, this goes back to the question about quiet title. I mean, you know, you, you can also file you know, in conjunction a quiet title action, uh, you know, to say like these, hey, these are the owners of the property. I need partition against these people. But we don't need to worry about, you know, other unknown people. Like I need the partition order against all interests, you know, because these are the owners, so. And I would just add on as a, as a shameless plug, uh, <laughs> if you're interested about what type of title insurance you need, and should get as a as a practitioner uh, before a partition or quiet title action. If you look at the back catalog of the ACPA uh, website, and for all of those who are members, all of those programs are, are free to access. Uh, we did our real estate section, which I'm on the executive committee. We did a, a whole program not too long ago. I can't remember the exact time, probably within the last two years, about that topic. And to answer the last question, I think Richard Roseman writes. Does the statistic about high percentage of people uh, passing without will or trust apply in California? Um, the article that I relied on in, in providing those statistics was that ABA article, and it was written in 2016. And I think it was a nationwide, it says nearly half of people die without a will. So to the exact extent it applies in California, I don't know, but probably about the same. And since we're almost running out of time, Angela, uh we're going to preempt you on this last question by Lisa in the in the chat. I'm not aware of any lists that the court maintains uh, for appraisals for appraisers. Do you guys do you guys know? No. So maybe a suggestion for the court to have one, but we're not aware of any. 
Well, I would suspect a judge would um, say request the party suggests appraisers for the court's mm -hmm. consideration. I mean, that's what um, totally unrelated. But I had a business valuation case, and the court the statute says the court is to appoint three appraisers. He said, "You guys tell me who you want, because <laughs> I don't, I don't, whatever you guys agree to, I'll use." So uh, I would suspect that that the parties you know, should be prepared to offer an appraiser's name when they go into the at the very beginning and to pay for it. And to pay for it, like who's paying for it? You know, the party's yeah. got to pay for it. You know. Mm -hmm. With that, I think we've answered all your questions. Thank you for attending. If Anne Thank wants you. to jump back in, here I am. <laughs> <clears throat> hey, thank you all, everybody. That was really, uh, really great. You got it all in in a timely manner. It's really great. You guys did a great job. I know you were worried about that, so thank you, and thank you everyone for being um, on time and uh, good listeners. And uh, we'll get you the slides and your tender certificates very soon. I do want to remind you that we had a couple people who had this issue today. If you're logging in, make sure that you get your own individual email. A couple people have shown up twice, names have shown up twice today. And if if you're use, if somebody says, oh, I have the link and somebody sends it to you, you're going to show up as that person. You're not going to show up as yourself. You have to actually go in when Zoom sends you the, the link after you've registered with CCCBA. Zoom's going to send you something to say, register with us. You have to type your name and your email in, and then they will send you the link to this particular meeting. And that's how we verify our attendance. So please be sure that that you 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 um, you don't share. This is one case you don't want to share. <laughs> um, thanks everybody. Have a great uh, weekend, and uh, we'll see you all soon. Yeah, thank everybody for attending. We appreciate the interest. Thank you. Thank you. Bye guys. Have a great weekend. Stop.